Hello, everyone, and welcome to Full Time, where we take you around the world of soccer locally, regionally, nationally, and internationally. Full Time is presented by the Game Sports Podcast and powered by 91 Network. You're listening to Season 4, Episode 12 of Full Time. I'm your host, Daniel Scarpino, and with me is our co-host, Gaetano Gallo. Before we begin today's show, Full Time is sponsored by Little Caesars Pizza. With their two locations in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, you can download and access the Pizza Portal app so you can enjoy a delicious hot and ready pizza from Little Caesars today. We remind our listeners that recordings of Full Time occur weekly or bi-weekly and uploads to all of our platforms for public viewing and listening occur weekly or bi-weekly as well. Folks, we welcome you back to Full Time. It is yet another opportunity for us to talk about the sport that connects us all. G, how are you tonight, my friend? I'm doing great. Had the day off, got the Habs game game going, getting ready to talk footy with you. Can't ask for a better day than that. Sounds like a spectacular day indeed. And uh, yeah, this uh, it's a great Thursday evening. Nice little chill outside, but glad to be indoors, of course. In how today, are you doing, Scarps? Well, hey, hey, listen, you know what? I'm, I'm <laughs> doing great. I'm doing great. Um, yeah, so I, uh, well, it was a good day today and did some coaching after school for the, the school that I teach at and yeah, ran some errands and whatnot. So pretty, pretty typical Thursday for me, to be honest. But yeah, everything's good on my end. And in today's show, we're going to talk about Paul Pogba, Everton's point deduction. We're going to review the Carabao Cup final. We're going to talk about the fifth round of the FA Cup. We're going to talk Europe's big five. And we're going to do a little bit of local soccer. As always, if anyone would like to listen to our previous content, please check us out at Full Time on the Game Sports Podcast and 91 Network. And without further ado, Gaetano, and to everyone who has taken the time to tune in here today, let's kick off. We begin today's show by discussing Paul Pogba. According to BBC Sport, Paul Pogba has been banned for four years as tests found elevated levels of testosterone in his system. The Aventus midfielder has been banned as a result from football after failing his drugs test in August of 2023. Gatano, some otherwise shocking news this. Uh, please give us your thoughts. I mean, like, given his recent, uh, like, injury history, he's probably only going to miss, like, four or five games through this. So, like, not a huge, huge loss for him. Um, but, yeah, he's, like, in all seriousness, uh, you know, he just has never found that level that he was at at Juve originally, uh, you know, over his time at United and back at Juve. I don't want to say I'm surprised that he got busted for like doping, but like, I'm not shocked that he maybe looked for alternative methods to kind of try and find that level again. Uh, Unfortunately for him, he never found that level and he uh, got busted for it. So uh, it kind of sucks to suck, you know? Pretty much. Yes. And the only thing that I can hope is that mentally he's in a good place because he's, I mean, his career was kind of going this way anyways, right? Yeah. Like, and it actually was probably going more like this. Um, so the only thing I could hope is that if there's going to be any level of rebound after this, these four years are up, that he can still stay within football for his own mental capacities and his own sake in that way. But yeah, just um, some really shocking news. But like you said, when when you're when you're here in football and then you start to to drop. You know, sometimes you go to any length to, to make sure that you could stay where you want to be. And in his case, he got caught. And in the modern day, I think it's so difficult to get away with these sorts of things. You think about like steroid era and baseball. I mean, after that, it was pretty much every sport just kind of cracked down on stuff. So, yeah, Paul Pogba banned for four years in football. Uh, and I don't know if there's any chance for an appeal or not, but I'm going to assume no, because any time that you mess around with that sort of stuff, you're in for uh, you're in for some trouble. We now move over to some other news in the world of football, and that is Everton's 10-point deduction in the Premier League after appeal now being reduced to six points. The following excerpt that I'm about to read comes from ESPN.com. The article starts with, quote, Everton's punishment for breaching the Premier League's profit and sustainability rules has been reduced from 10 points to six on appeal by the Merseyside Club, the Premier League announced on Monday, February 26th. The initial 10-point sanction was handed down in November, with Everton immediately filing their appeal against what was the harshest penalty in Premier League history. 
In a statement on Monday, the league said Everton FC appealed the sanction imposed against it on nine grounds, each of which related to the sanction rather than the fact of the breach, which the club admitted. Two of those nine grounds were upheld by the appeal board, which has substituted the original points deduction of 10 for six. This revised sanction has immediate effect and the Premier League table will be updated today to reflect this. The decision moves Everton from 17th in the league to 15th, five points clear of the relegation zone. Catano, some pretty significant news in the world of football as, um, as far as the Premier League goes and Everton goes anyways. Um, your thoughts here, sir? Yeah, uh, I think this is a pretty nice boost for Everton. Gets them uh, a little bit more clear of the danger zone uh, than they were previously. Uh, also, it's kind of a nice, not well, nice may be the wrong word, but it's nice to see a team like getting kind of a bit of a benefit against the league. It's not just the league saying, oh, it's a 10 point deduction. Your appeal is going to be, you know, useless. Like it's nice to see that the, the the justice system of the Premier League or like world football kind of works. Um, yeah. So I think it uh, gives them that nice boost. Probably, I mean, five points off the drop should be safe. I'm going to, you know, knock on wood. Uh, but yeah, they should kind of see them relatively safe for the rest of the season. Yeah, and that's that, that kind of leads me into what I wanted to ask you next. Do you think now, do you think that's going to give them like, you know, you hear about like the new manager bounce or sometimes when a new player comes into a club, it's like, whoa, that team looks different. They look like a brand new team. Do you think that this is going to just like reinvigorate the squad? And, and do you think maybe they go on a run here to end off the season? Yeah, I think it might give them a, a big boost, you know, kind of. Now it's going to change the, the mentality of the team from, you know, kind of battling relegation to, hey, like we're going to push for mid table here. I think that's going to be a good boost. And I could definitely see them putting a run together here. I totally do as well, because uh, I've always liked Sean Deitch as a manager. And there are some decent players on that Everton side. And, you know, I, I think now just knowing that they're they're probably going to be safe, knowing that they're going to be where they want to be next year. I think that they're just going to push on from this and I could see them finishing maybe even top half of the table, but certainly around that 10th position. So, gee, let's let's discuss the the cup final that just took place in England, and that was the Carabao Cup final. The final that took place between Chelsea and Liverpool at Wembley Stadium went just this past Sunday, February 25th. Needing extra time to decide things after the game remained nil nil after 90 minutes, it was Liverpool captain Virgil Van Dijk who popped up in the 118th minute to score a header off of a corner kick to win the Carabao Cup for the 10th time in Liverpool's history. Liverpool defeat Chelsea as a result to win the final by a score of 1-0. to nil. Gee, it was a, a really fascinating end to the game uh, that was pretty much, in, you know, well in the balance for the most part. First and foremost, just your thoughts on uh, the Liverpool win uh, in this cup final. Uh, kind of an awful game, not going to lie. Uh, yeah. <laughs> You know, I, as a neutral, it was all like I'm never going to be super into a Chelsea Liverpool game, uh, just as a City fan. But just the the quality of football was not um, the greatest. Uh, both sides dealing with a lot of injuries. Uh, but yeah, for Liverpool to win it, kind of on Klopp's uh, you know farewell tour, I guess if we're going to call it that. Uh, you know, has the, it adds to the nice narrative, the nice story for that for him. Um, I'm I'm obviously I wouldn't have been too thrilled uh, kind of with either result. But uh, I think for the for the narrative, you know, the footballing history side of it, I do think it's nice that Klopp kind of at least is going to get one trophy on his way out. Almost certainly, yeah. And you could see the emotion that kind of overcame him and many of the fans, uh, even some of the players for that matter. So, yeah, it definitely meant a lot for them. But like like you said, to your point, game wasn't particularly fascinating, wasn't particularly entertaining, but it was a pretty cool ending. And, uh, yeah, that was that was nice to see that uh, Liverpool picked up that victory, especially having so many young players in the team, which we're going to talk about here shortly. So, G, you and I both picked this game correct in terms of who we thought would win, and we both said Liverpool. However, our score predictions were not quite there. You, you had Liverpool winning 3-1. to one, I had them winning 3-2. to two, And it turns out 1-0 as a result in extra time. How come, G, do you think that the goals didn't come in this game the way that we thought that they would? Uh, I think it's entirely down to the goalkeepers. So uh, Kelleher and Petrovic uh, had nine and ten saves respectively uh, in this game, uh, which is like that's a pretty superhuman effort in a final for both of these guys. Um, I think I think it's really as simple as that. You know, there were big chances created. There were a few big chances missed, but you know, if you have keepers putting up double-digit saves, like it's going to be a long day for the forwards. <laughs> 
almost definitely. And there definitely were chances in that game. We're going to talk about some of those chances here in a moment's time. But I think, yeah, the 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 goalkeepers definitely had a lot to say. And uh, Jurgen Klopp said it after the game. Uh, Kelleher, second uh, best number two goalkeeper in the world. And uh, ah. I, I don't know. Every time every, I feel like every time that guy plays, he wins. I've never seen him lose. I don't think <laughs> in the Liverpool shirt. Every time he's he's in like the Carabao Cup or the FA Cup or something, or he backs up Allison in a random game. I feel like he always wins. I don't know. I mean, it's also a thing. He has a pretty good team playing in front of him too, right? So, you know, and I don't, I don't mean to, you know, disrespect or take anything away from him, but I just think that, you know, it's just uh, it's just a hell of a shout to, to kind of throw out there. Yeah, I think, uh, and, and you know how managers work. Sometimes they say things just to give their guys a boost. And uh, Oh, you, you have to. You have yeah. to. Like, you, you can't learn, you're in cop, Klopp can't come out and say, oh, He's he's all right. Like he's fine. Like you have to hype them up. Like no doubt. But you know, kind of you know, taking that step back and looking at it realistically, maybe not the best show. He's like not not totally off, but yeah. But I do feel like, and I, I'm serious. Like I don't know if I've ever seen the guy lose a game. It's just like every time I watch him, he seems to find a way. Like you said, good team in front of him for sure. But uh, yeah, Carabao Cup winner nonetheless. And in this fixture, it is actually the most frequent fixture, Gatano, in English football, meaning that no two teams uh, have played against each other more often than Chelsea and Liverpool. So this cup final uh, amplifies things all the more. And it is Jurgen Klopp's team, as we said, who find a way to win this game in spite of having a long litany of injuries going into this contest. Gee, how exactly did they manage to get over the line despite missing so many key players? Because you take a look at that injury list, the likes of, Salah, Trent Alexander, Arnold. Um, the list goes on and on and on and on. How, how did they manage to get over the line? Uh, what I think it really came down to was the key players that were healthy, you know, played up to their levels and maybe a little more. You know, Virgil van Dijk, Kanate, Robertson, you know, uh, Alexis McAllister all had phenomenal games. Keeper as well, um, uh, Kelleher. So I think, you know, not that uh, they were obviously missing those uh, you know, injured key players, but the key players who were there stepped up in a massive way for them. Yeah, I think I think you summarized that beautifully. And when you need your biggest players in any sport, but especially in football, you need your biggest guys to be your biggest guys, especially when the chips are down. You expect them to step up and and step up in a big way. And Liverpool's main guys, the ones that you just listed, certainly did just that. And what we can say is that Chelsea probably won't find a more opportune time to play against Liverpool than this Cup final, purely because. They, uh, they had so many injuries to their squad, and Chelsea was, well, I'm not going to say they were fully fit, but they were definitely more healthy than Liverpool. However, Chelsea did let it slip away. Chelsea did have a Raheem Sterling goal ruled out in the contest for an offside in the buildup, which was ruled against Nicholas Jackson. But even then, Gaetano, we talked about the chances created earlier, that goal being ruled out. Do you think that Chelsea should have made more of some of the other chances that they did have in the match? I definitely think so. Um, you know... Look, I love Raheem Sterling. Man, I'm going to say he's a Man City legend. Some of the goals he scored, you know, won us titles. Uh, one of, you know, our greatest ever goal scorers. I just, uh, you know, goal contribution wise, uh, you know, assists as well. Um, he's one of England's best players of kind of this generation. Has been, you know, one of their better players when they go to World Cups. But he always just kind of has that, you know, that awful game in him where he, he could, you know, we you talked about it with your men's league team uh, the other night. You know, you could play for eight hours and not score a goal. Raheem Sterling had one of those games where he could have, they could have played that game for eight hours. It could still be going now. He would not have a goal, would not have an assist. Um, it just kind of comes with him and that kind of sucks. But uh, yeah, and you know, when he has one of those games, you are kind of hoping one of the other forwards, you know, Jackson, you know, and Kunku off the bench, Mudrick off the bench, Palmer kind of steps up and gets that goal, but none of them kind of had their shooting boots or really playmaking boots on them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I fully agree with that. We uh, I had a conversation with somebody the other day and they said, you know, this this victory for Liverpool was just purely guts, grit, determination, grind, heart. Did you feel that way as well? Yeah. And I mean, I've seen the the tag floating around the Chelsea's billion dollar bottle jobs. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it really it really does. You know, the, the shoe fits here. You know, you're bringing 100 million play 100 million pound players off the bench, you know, and they're making zero impact on a game against, you know, a team that is bringing on their, you know, academy players off the bench in extra time. Like, it's just, uh, yeah, just awful from Chelsea. Definitely. And like we always say, sometimes money can't uh, can't win you things in time. Maybe they can, but you still got to do the business on the pitch. 
So a trophy still escapes uh, Chelsea manager Maurizio Pochettino during his tenure in English football. I believe he's been with three clubs, Southampton, uh, Tottenham and Chelsea now. And gee, a lot of people are calling for the Chelsea manager to be sacked. Do you think that there is reason for Pochettino to be in question or was this, you know, in this game in particular, was this just a case of maybe the players not being up to scratch, like you said, didn't have their finishing boots on or did they just get uh, outclassed by a better team and a better manager on the day? Um, so I think it's kind of, that's like two questions, like should he be sacked and, the you know, is the cup final loss his fault? I don't think they're entirely intertwined, but they do are like, there's a, there's a couple crossing paths here. Um, do I think the cup final loss is his fault? Not particularly. I don't think Chelsea played like terribly, like tactically, the system was set up, you know, pretty well. Liverpool didn't like totally run riot like I had expected. Um, but yeah, you know. Nicholas Jackson isn't offside on that, you know, goal, then it's a totally different game. Like, you know, you bring these hundred million pound players off the bench. There's only so much Poch can do, right? Like if he, yeah. he brings them on, puts them on the field, you know, sets them up. If Nkunku just has a stinker, like that's, you know, there's only so much he can do. But do I also think that Poch probably isn't the guy long-term at Chelsea? Yes. Do I think they should be looking to bring in someone new in the summer? Uh, yeah. But I do I think this cup final loss is entirely on him and it should get him sacked? No, if if you get what I'm picking up here. <laughs> I definitely do. And and I'm similar to you. I'm not the exact same, but I'm similar to you. I'm definitely spot on with you in terms of the cup final. And the reason I say that is because if you take a look at the chances created, and I've always believed this as a coach too, if you can set your team up in a way to at least create chances and people are in the right position. As a coach, that's not a concern. I think that you can, I'm not going to say put your feet up, but you could rest assured and you could lay your head on the pillow at night saying, I've trained my team well enough that I've put them in positions that they can score, but the manager can't physically put the ball in the net. So I think that one's down to the players. I don't think that this cup final's on him. Do I think that, you know, calling for the sack is something that should be done? I'm going a little bit different than you. I think that he deserves not just this season. I think he also deserves going into next season. And the reason that I say that is because Chelsea in patches this season and small patches, I will admit, have played well. I take a look at uh, the City game. I take a look at the both Arsenal. City games, both yeah. City games. Yeah. And there, there have been uh, a few other games in there as well. There was a game against Luton Town. They played really well. So, again, I take a look at Chelsea in patches and they have played well. Now, there's been moments when they've been horrific. But I think when you see those little glimmers, I think that shows that the manager is actually connecting with the squad on some level so i think that yes he'll get definitely get the rest of this season obviously because we're coming to a close here shortly but um i also think that he deserves next season now if things don't materialize next season i think to your point you probably got to start going in the managerial shopping uh section door and gee it is uh, liverpool who win this uh cup final like we said for a record-breaking 10th time how important do you think this uh, this trophy is, not just from a historical perspective necessarily, because we know uh, what Liverpool has accomplished in that regard, but more so for how this sets them up on their way uh, for the rest of the season, because they are still involved in, I believe, another three competitions, Premier League, FA Cup and Europa League. Yeah, I've always loved the Carabao Cup, uh, you know, and Pep's talked about it uh, when he came to England. You know, his assistants and everyone kind of told me, oh, like, don't worry about Carabao Cup. Like, the, you know, they Fer, Fergie played his kids in it. Like, you know, it was just kind of a, a throwaway thing. But Pep always wanted to win it. And he always said, like, you get a trophy in February. It's a, it's a major, in quotations, trophy in February. Like, that's a great boost to have for kind of the run-in. Uh, so I think it's huge for them for this season to kind of uh, get the ball rolling, kind of get to, kind of get a taste for winning a trophy. Uh, especially, the, you know, they have a lot of young players playing in that game that kind of get that experience of playing in a cup final at Wembley I think it's huge for them uh yeah and, and I'm gonna I think it's I think it's massive and the reason I say that is because of the way that they won it with having to your point so many kids involved in that game once all those other guys come back into the team the likes of Salah Allison Trent Alexander Arnold all of those players uh Tiago everybody I think the hunger is going to be there like maybe never before we had kids who just won a cup final well, we got to go get ourselves one, if not two, maybe three. So I think this is going to set them up really, really well. And, uh, you know, they deserve this victory. And like, you know, I was saying earlier, grits, uh, heart, guts, determination, and everything. And uh, it is uh, Liverpool, of course, once again, who are Carabao Cup champions of 2024 uh, after defeating Chelsea in extra time by a score of one to nil. So until next season, uh, Carabao Cup in the books, G, and uh, 
we'll see what happens next season. Hopefully, and I, I know. Did you say that the, the license had run out, so it's going to be called something different now? I'm pretty sure this is the last year of Carabao, unless they renew over the summer. But uh, yeah, I guess it, it's just like the League Cup, I guess would be what it's called then. If, uh, you know, until that, uh, the next sponsorship is sorted out. Yeah, well, it'll, it won't be before long until we're reviewing the next season's Carabao Cup or whatever it is called. But always a good bit of fun uh, reviewing that one. So again, Liverpool champions of 2024 for the Carabao Cup. And from that club competition to another one, the FA Cup fifth round has just finished up and we were treated to some tight contests as well as some other proper drillings. G, how did you enjoy the fifth round of the FA Cup? Uh, it was pretty good. Uh, a little disappointed with one or two results here and there, but uh, the actual quality of the games was great. Uh, the excitement level was great and I'm really looking forward to the next round as well. Certainly. And what we're going to do is we are going to highlight each of the contests here and now for you all that just took place this past week. First, it was Maidstone United who made the trip up to Coventry. Unfortunately for many, including us, the dream run of the semi-professional side Maidstone comes to an end after, they've, after they were outclassed, excuse me, by Coventry by a score of five to nil. Gee, nothing for this Maidstone uh, team to hang their heads about as uh, they were able to get into the last 16 teams of this competition in the FA Cup. Uh, and, and again, a prestigious honor for for any club in English football for that matter but certainly for a semi-professional club your thoughts on this game and the run that uh, Maidstone had in this competition yeah this this is the big disappointment for me I just one more round would have just been so special for them uh they they gave it 110 percent and just unfortunate for them that their 110 percent just was not enough uh, against Coventry um yeah I think it's just it's going to be remembered as you know a, you know one of those miracle runs in the Carib in the FA Cup you know, the magic of the cup we always talk about, uh, you know, they didn't win it. They didn't, you know, get to, you know, the quarterfinal or anything, but still a huge, massive run for them. Uh, just credit to their players, their manager for kind of making that. And also credit to their fans for kind of, you know, yeah. being able to enjoy that, you know, creating that atmosphere at their games, uh, traveling uh, to Coventry. I thought they were great there as well. Um, yeah, I thought it was a good game. Coventry probably well, definitely should have won on paper uh, and over the course of the match, definitely deserved it. Yeah, and if nothing else to that extent for Maidstone United ever happens in their history, this uh, this definitely will live in their memories forever. Leicester City travelled up to Bournemouth for their tie. It took extra time, but a 105th minute winner from Leicester's Abdul Fatawu would seal the deal as Leicester books their ticket into the quarterfinals, defeating Bournemouth 1-0. Gee, a wonder goal from Leicester in this one to win it. The 2021 FA Cup winners are into the quarters. If you could, speak to the season that the Foxes are having both in the FA Cup and in the championship. Yeah, they're having a great season in the championship. Uh, you know, should be looking to bounce right back up. I'm not sure. I haven't looked at the table uh, from top. this past week. Yeah, I know they were. I, it's not totally off. It, like, they're not totally clear. Excuse me, two seconds top. to pull it up. Because I do want to talk about it because it is pretty impressive. And yeah, so they're only six points off the top, or six points clear of second place. So it's uh, not that it's entirely wrapped up uh, in any way, shape, or form, but the way they've been yeah. playing is great on a little bit of a skid in the league, lost their last two. Uh, but I think this FA Cup win is going to kind of give them that little bit of a boost, you know, playing in the quarterfinals, probably going to be playing against other Premier League teams or should be playing against Premier League teams in the quarterfinals. Uh, should be a nice kind of test for them for next season uh, to see kind of where their squad is at because they did lose some key players, uh, Harvey Barnes, James Madison. So, yeah, I think it's uh, a good win for them and they should be looking forward to the next round. I definitely would think so. And uh, we're going to review it in our next show or preview it, I should say, um, in terms of those matchups. But they'll be playing against Chelsea. So, um, yes, yeah, there's certainly certainly there to, to have a shot and uh yeah i think that this gives them a good boost moving forward in the championship but of course uh remaining in the fa cup competition it needed penalties after a one-to-one -one score line at the end of 120 minutes but it was newcastle who defeated blackburn uh four to three on kicks from the penalty spot to send themselves through to the next round of the fa cup gee it was it was a tight one but your thoughts on this clash yeah, they Newcastle squeaked through. It's uh, probably not uh, as comfortable as they would have liked and probably should have been, but uh, it ended up getting the job done in the end for them. Yeah, the, they were calling it the Alan Shearer Derby, and uh, I got a good <laughs> that one. Newcastle squeak it, and they'll be uh, they'll be up uh, 
They'll be moving on in the FA Cup to the next round. Manchester City made short work of Luton Town, defeating them by a score of 6-2 to two and easily cruising into the quarters as a result. Gee, it was the Erling Holland show, and that pretty much sums it up. He himself scored five of Manchester City's six goals. What a performance from him on the day, and what a performance from your Manchester City. Break this one down, sir. Uh, so, like, as much as it was the Holland show, it was also the Kevin De Bruyne show. Uh, there was a yeah. point, Holland's first four goals were all assisted by Kevin De Bruyne. Four goals, four assists. It's just... It's so nice to see them back on the pitch together. Like, we haven't really seen it a lot this year, but, uh, you know, even though it was, you know, against Luton in the FA Cup, like, it's just so nice to see that again, that they're clicking. Uh, KDB is already at our, our city's top assist uh, getter for the season. He's made like 12 appearances. He's just phenomenal. Um, city just looked really good. It was nice to see a lot of uh, guys get back into lineup. Bernardo was healthy. Uh, John Stones, you know, staying healthy. Uh, Jack Grealish did go off injured, which is a bit of a concern because he's coming back from a, a little uh, injury. So hopefully that's nothing too major. But other than that, yeah, very, uh, very comfortable for City, which uh, it has not been the case in the last few weeks. So that was nice to see. Yeah, and geez, sorry, just just two quick ones for you, uh, being uh, obviously Manchester City. Um, yeah. you were, I don't want to say you were concerned, but you said Kenilworth Road was a tough place to go to. Do you, you kind of backtrack on that now, or, or do you still think that it's still a tough ground? I still think it's a tough ground. I just think, you know, when you get KDB and Holland in that form, like... You know, Kenilworth oh, Road, the Bernabeu, like, bring it on. Like, they will they will do the business for you. Um, so, yeah, I, I do think still Kenilworth Road, because, you know, Luton also, like, they played well. Like, they could have folded, and that could have been 10 or 12 easily. But they yeah. did play really well. They got their couple goals, uh, you know, just outclassed simply. Yeah, and and my second one, because you brought up Grealish. Uh, Pep went into the media and said that it's, it's on Grealish uh, to, to make sure that he's performing at the, the highest level and that it's going to be up to him to make sure that he plays that I found, I don't know. I found it to be interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that? So there was a little stretch before uh, the first injury that he was just coming back from where he, I think it was four or five games in a row that he was just on the bench only coming on as a substitute. Um, and there were, there were some concerns like, is it an attitude thing? Is it a, you know, or is it just, a, is it could just be like a tactical pep rotation thing? Like, you know, if he doesn't, like that matchup on the left side would prefer Doku. Uh, then he got hurt, missed a bunch of games, which, you know, kind of sucks. Uh, so the kind of the reaction was like, you know, when he comes back, is he going to, you know, slot right back into the starting lineup? Is he, you know, is he still going to have to battle with Doku a bit? Is it going to be just a tactical thing? So I think it's just Pep's way of, you know, publicly kind of telling Grealish, like, hey, like, just because you're the 100 million pound guy, key in the treble last year, like, you're not just walking into the starting 11. And I think Jack Grealish knows that, you know, his first season at City was kind of similar. Uh, last season, he definitely became kind of that, you know, not first name on the team sheet, but through the run in, he was kind of the guy. Like there was no, no doubt about it on the left-hand side. Uh, so I think this is Pep's way of just kind of, you know, friendly, not so friendly reminder. Like, hey, like just because you were the guy last year doesn't mean you're the guy this year. You still have to, you know, put in that, you know, if it's that extra work, put in that, you know, extra time in the gym, whatever it is to, you know, kind of really assert yourself as, you know, the number one option there. Right. So, yeah, just trying to do it maybe to create the hunger again. So when he comes back, yeah, just, that right, yeah that makes sense to me. Want to pick your brain on that one. And after their cup final defeat this past Sunday, Chelsea looked to rebound against Leeds and they did just that. Although they did leave it until late, it was Chelsea who come away with a 3-2 victory thanks to a Connor Gallagher 90th minute winner. G, uh, excuse me, G, uh, Chelsea, they, uh, they, they get the job done here in the end, but only just. Your thoughts? Yeah, um, I mean, you kind of summed it up both. They, they got the job done. Like, that's, <laughs> you know, at this point in the season, you know, you have the loss in the Carabao Cup final as well. Like, Chelsea kind of have to look at it this way for the rest of the season. Just, like, get the job done. Doesn't really matter how you do it. Doesn't have to be pretty. Doesn't have to be, you know, beautiful, like, posh at Tottenham football. Like, it's get the wins you need to get, get the results you need to get, try and, you know, either challenge for a European spot, win a car uh, FA Cup, like, so it's, it's ugly. It's not, uh, you know, not one the fans are going to, you know, clamor for more of, but they did get the job done. Yeah. And it is about pleasing the fans and uh, what does please fans. Yes. Pretty football for sure. But also more than that, 
wins. And I think to your point from last show, you said if the game was played at Allen Road, you would have taken leads. And I think that uh, you would have had a very strong case there because as close as it was at Stamford Bridge, um, it probably would have been tipped in Leeds' favour if it was uh, at Allen Road. Manchester United took the trip to Nottingham Forest for, the F- for their FA Cup clash. Excuse me. Uh, it wasn't until Casemiro made his presence known in the 89th minute to snatch the game away from Forest and thus book United's place in the quarterfinals. Manchester United win by a score of 1-0. to nil. Gee, United find a way to get over the line. What can you say about this? Yeah, similar to the, the Chelsea game. It wasn't pretty, but uh, they did get the job done. That's all that's really going to matter to them, uh, to Eric Ten Hag, the fans, the players. Um, I wish Forrest would have gone it. They uh, didn't play terribly. I thought they definitely could have gotten, uh, you know, you know, if you play, replay that game 10 more times or nine more times, it's probably, you know, four or five wins for United, four or five wins uh, for Forrest. Uh, so I don't want to call United lucky. Um, but like I said, Chelsea, they, you know, doesn't have to be pretty. They got the job done into the next round. That's kind of all they can really push for. Yeah, and I've never been a believer that when you know it's a good thing to go out of cup competitions because when people said that about Arsenal um, last season, I thought that that was garbage because people were saying, oh, they could just focus on the Premier League now. But what I will say is because Nottingham Forest is in a very different position where they're trying to avoid relegation, now they just have one focus in mind to avoid going down. So this actually could bode well for them. But uh, I think that, to your point, they would have much rather stayed in this cup competition than go out. And if they played that game, like you said, another 10 times, who knows? They, they, they probably could have pipped it uh, you know, over United because they did play pretty good. Wolves and Brighton met up for what was to be an entertaining battle. A very early Mario Lamina goal for Wolves would be all that they needed as they were able to see off a hungry Brighton side by a score of 1-0. to nil. Gee, Wolves get the result that they craved. Uh, please speak to their recent run of form in all competitions because they've uh, they've moved up into the top half of the table now of the Premier League and obviously now going to the uh, quarterfinal of the FA Cup. Yeah, this is probably the most uh, entertaining game of the lot for this round of the uh, FA Cup. Uh, really was in the balance, you know, outside the early goal. It was, you know, could have gone either way. Uh, yeah, Wolves are kind of rolling now. Uh, we haven't kind of seen them play this well since Nuno was there. And that was, uh, what, almost three years ago now, right? Sounds about um, right, yeah. Yeah, they're just kind of rolling. It's uh, it's weird because they're not playing the way that, you know, I kind of know Wolves to play as, which is, you know, the back three, the big bombing wing backs down the sides, you know, Adama Traore just terrorizing us. Like, so it's weird to see them kind of this tactical shift, something new uh, that we haven't seen from Wolves before. But yeah, they've been playing uh, phenomenally and it bodes really well that they're into the quarterfinals here and they're having a great run in the Premier League. Definitely, you know, should... I'm going to say it again, should be safe, knocking on wood. Um, but yeah, like they're looking really good. Probably, uh, I don't want to say challenge for Europe next season if they continue this, but should be like very comfortably top half of the table next season if they're going to keep this up uh, and kind of build on it. Yeah, and Wolves is uh, one of those clubs that, and I don't know how other people feel in it, and I'm sure you feel similar to me, but just one of those clubs that you respect, like went down to the championship for a little while, grinded, you know, really found an identity he got back up to the Premier League, played some really nice football under Nuno, and they just kind of cracked on ever since, even though they've had a few managers in between. But I've always found a way to, to battle hard and, and earn other clubs' respect. So, yeah, definitely like Wolves, and, and they deserve their spot in the quarters. And finally, it was Liverpool who played host to Southampton after coming off of their Carabao Cup win this past Sunday. They continued to ride their momentum, Liverpool did, by defeating Southampton by a score of 3-0. Gee, Liverpool continue to do their business. The floor is yours, sir. Yeah, and, you know, Southampton aren't, you know, they're not a minnow. They're not a small team. Uh, they are in the championship. They're uh, battling for the promotion there. Been, you know, Premier League regular for the better part of the last 15 years. Um, yeah, I think it was uh, kind of a, a good step for Liverpool kind of after the Carabao Cup, you know, to kind of keep their good uh, run of form going. I'm not overly shocked by the result. Uh, you know, they should have the more quality than uh, Southampton, even with their injuries. So, yeah, not shocking. Um, but also, I don't think Southampton played terribly either. I thought they played pretty all right, you know. Uh, yeah, some kind of, up, uh, sorry to cut you off. Some of their build-up. No, no, go for it. I was able to watch that one in most. Uh, some of their build-up play to get out of Liverpool's intense pressing was really, really impressive. Yeah, and that's, I was going to say, like, it kind of bodes well for them that they, you know, held their own against the Premier League team, uh, you know especially if they're going to go up in the summer, do a bit of business over the summer, then like, you know, they should, you know, kind of hope to build on that to be uh, kind of Premier League regulars again. 
certainly. And uh, yeah, Liverpool obviously rolled that momentum from their from their cup final win into this game. And uh, the only thing that kind of surprised me was that Klopp, Klopp did rotate the side, don't get me wrong, but I actually thought he was going to rotate it way more. Not to say that he was going to throw away the FA Cup competition because he was never going to do that, obviously, but I actually thought he was going to rotate the squad even more than he did. But yeah, in the end, uh, just a superb performance from Liverpool. And in terms of our picks, G, you went five for eight, having Maidstone, Bournemouth, and Nottingham Forest coming up a little bit short. I managed to go seven for eight, only getting the Maidstone game wrong. In the end, how would you sum up these uh, this round of games, sir? Uh, predictable, but that's not a bad thing. You know, I think, um, you know, for the most part, the better teams won. Uh, it was unfortunate, you know, like for the narrative that a team like Maidstone doesn't go through. Unfortunate for me as a City fan that United go through, but uh Overall, really, really enjoyed uh, this round of the uh, FA Cup. I'm looking forward to the quarterfinals. Definitely. And fortunate for you that your team is still in the competition. It won't be before long that the quarterfinals of this competition will kick off. It's all on to Saturday, March 16th, where all four matches will be played and all played at the exact same time. In fact, I believe they're all 11 a.m. kickoffs. So in our next episode of Full Time, we are going to preview each of the quarterfinal matches for all of you. This is Daniel Scarpino and Gaetano Gallo, and you are listening to Full Time on the Game Sports Podcast and 91 Network. A reminder that Full Time is sponsored by Little Caesars Pizza. With their two locations in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, you can download and access the Pizza Portal app for any of those two locations. Have a delicious hot and ready pizza from Little Caesars today. Let's turn it over to Europe's Big Five, Gaetano. And since the last time that we spoke, which was just seven days ago. Nothing in the standings has drastically changed in any of uh, Europe's big five leagues. So we're going to do things a little bit different. We're going to go in a bit of a different direction this time. And what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the teams who sit at the top of the table right now and what things might look like moving forward. For review purposes, Liverpool is the top of the English Premier League in uh, England, of course, Inter are top of Serie A in Italy. Real Madrid uh, are top in Spain's La Liga. Leverkusen are first place in Germany's Bundesliga. And PSG are occupying top spot in France's Ligue 1. Katana, which of these five teams for you has impressed you most this season so far? It's going to be a boring answer, but it's Bayer Leverkusen. We've talked about them all season, how just... Like like I said, we've run out of words to describe how phenomenal they have been this year. Uh, Not just getting the results, but playing beautiful football. Xavi Alonso is probably the most in-demand manager in the world right now. Um, yeah. yeah, I just I just can't say enough great things about them. They are just, I mean, like, it's not even close. They're probably the best team in Europe this season. Yeah, I, I think that's an obviously unbelievable shout. And it was so hard when I was looking at this question specifically because I wanted to say Leverkusen too. But for whatever reason, I couldn't get away from what I wanted to pick and what I have picked. And the team that really has impressed me the most is Inter. And the reason I say that is because of all of their departures in the summer with having to adapt and do things tactically a little bit different. I know we're just talking about things domestically here, but they're still in Europe. They're, they're probably going to go through uh, to the next round of the Champions League. I, I've loved everything that Inter has done, the way that they've adapted, the way that they've played, they've battled some adversity. They haven't spent really a ton of money. Um, so I, I'm going to say that that's the most impressive team to me so far. And gee, this next one, I might get the same result, but maybe not. Which team has surprised you the most? Yeah, I, like again, it's going to be Bayer Leverkusen because it's it's such a boring thing to say, but like, you know, if you would, you know, we if we were at one on the clock back to August and you told me, hey, like Bayer Leverkusen are going to be undefeated, you know, in mid February or end of February, sorry, you know, in the league, you know, I don't not running away with it quite quite yet, but just about like. I would have, you know, I would have laughed in your face and told you you knew nothing. Like, you know, this is nobody saw this coming, like at all. And I just, I can't, I can't not put that as the biggest surprise. And and that's exactly where I'm at because that's my biggest surprise in terms of the team that has surprised me the most. It has to be Leverkusen, purely because. I mean, it's never a team in Germany's Bundesliga that you think are going to do poorly. You don't think that they're going to win, but you don't. It's one of those teams that you don't necessarily think about. It's almost like a, well, we just talked about them a little bit ago, like a Wolves in the Premier League. Like we wouldn't say, oh, Wolves are going to dominate the Premier League this year, just like we wouldn't say that Liverpool are going to dominate the Bundesliga. But they've completely surprised us with the way that they've played obviously not losing a single game, uh, just being completely dominant, doing things with the utmost class. 
So they're, they're also the team that has surprised me the most and in the best way possible. And gee, which of these uh, five teams currently at the top, in your opinion, is most likely to win their league? Um, probably PSG, just based on like the simple math. They're just... Well, the simple math and the fact they have no real competition uh, in Serie or in uh, Liga this year, I think uh, Inter are also kind of running away with it. But you know, Juve or AC Milan, you know, realistically could get those you know three or four wins in a row to kind of bring themselves uh, kind of back within that title race. I just don't see anyone challenging in France. Yeah, and and I'm in the exact same spot as you. I've also said PSG because you know, again, the competition isn't there in relation to them. PSG looking like they're probably going to go through to the next round of the Champions League. We inevitably know how that's going to end up at some point in the Champions League. But yeah, in their domestic league and league, or you'd have to say that they're they're probably the most favorite amongst all the top teams in Europe's big five. And G, which of these five teams currently at the top is most likely to drop out of first place before the season is over? Uh, so I'm going with Liverpool simply because City and Arsenal are just so close, uh, both in terms of quality of squad and like actual points in the table. Uh, I just I don't see this, the Premier League table staying the same way uh, from now to the end of the season. So I think Liverpool are the lo- most likely in that case to drop. But that also doesn't mean they're dropping out of the title race completely. I think they'll still be in it, uh, you know, come the end of the season here. Yes. And uh, it killed me to say because I wanted to to go to Spain for this one, but I also have yeah. this Liverpool. And again, only because you got a proper title challenge over there, Manchester City right on their heels, Arsenal right on the, the heels of City and Liverpool respectively. So again, with, with about 12 games left to go, I, I think that you'd have to say if you had to pick one team, it'd be Liverpool that have the, the biggest potential to drop out of first place. Now, excluding those five teams that we, uh, that we just mentioned, G, Which team in Europe's big five has sort of let you down in terms of making a proper title charge? So I was torn between two here, one in Germany and one in Spain. So the obvious one in Germany is Bayern Munich. Uh, They spend nearly 100 million pounds bringing in Harry Kane. And like they might go trophyless. Like it's just insane. And I know we're kind of mostly talking domestic league, but like they've just looked not right, which is so weird. Uh, You know, you bring in a known quality in, in Harry Kane. He's someone who just, bags goals for fun um and they just haven't been able to kind of put it together uh and then in spain barcelona uh we talked last season about xavi kind of uh kind of turning corners with them they were looking a little better not that they were going to be you know title favorites this season uh but they did you know some pretty good business over the summer bringing in like uh, ilkay gundogan who's been one of the best players in europe this season uh the first one to play, uh hit 100 chances created uh over the weekend uh and they just kind of really never put up much of a challenge outside of the first couple of weeks, you know, and Hirona putting up that, you know, title charge that lasted till only a couple of weeks ago, really. Um, you would have thought, oh, you know, if any kind of team other than Real Madrid, you know, could kind of do that, it would be uh, Barcelona, but they just kind of never got out of like second or third gear here. Yeah. And you know what? I, I've also gone to Spain and I've gone to it in two respects. Number one, I've also said Barcelona Yes, a little bit with the way that they play, but more so with the discontent at the club. When you have a season like you had last season, I don't think if you're a big club that you can come, I don't want to say full circle, but when you can come to the following season and have the discontent that you have there where the manager is now leaving the club at the end of the season. Yes, you're still involved in the Champions League. You know, you're still going to get a, a, a Champions League spot uh, in, in, you know, in La Liga, but they, they have not put together a proper title charge and they've let themselves down. And I've also picked on another team in Spain. And the reason that I've gone this way is because of the season that they had last year, albeit it wasn't great domestically, but I thought that they would have really kicked on after their success in Europe and that's Sevilla. I really thought they would have done better. And I'm not, you know, I say title charge. Yes. I thought that they would have challenged. I never thought that they were going to win it, but I thought that they would have been in that top four conversation and they're anything but that. So they've, they too have let themselves down. So I'm, I'm saying Barcelona and uh, Sevilla there. And there is uh, a reason why we highlight Europe's big five on our show almost every time that we record an episode, and that is because it delivers uh, on a week-in, week-out basis. And as we get into the business end of the season, we will continue to keep you all informed here on Full Time. And now it is time for a local soccer update. 
it seems uh, as though it's been a real long while since we've we've done one of these. But here on our show, we always acknowledge our roots, and our roots are right here in local soccer. Gee, the indoor soccer season uh, has been ticking along since October for youth, men's, and women's soccer in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. We've quite literally been at the indoor soccer fields for five months, nearly half of a year. Week in, week out, it's just like Europe's Big Five. Uh, we're getting into the business end of the season as well um, for, again, youth, men's, and women's soccer as uh, we're, re- we're really uh, nearly getting ready to kickstart our playoffs. You just finished wrapping up the league with some games in hand, and um, my team is still battling to do the same. How have you enjoyed the indoor soccer season so far, my friend? It's been good. Uh... A little more uh, of a challenge than we were maybe expecting. Uh, I thought uh, a couple of the newer teams in the league really uh, pushing us uh, a little more than we're used to, which is uh, always good. But it is nice to have it wrapped up uh, kind of before the end of the season. Uh, I joked last night about uh, getting a couple guards of honor. I don't actually expect them, but it would be nice. Um, but yeah, so uh, our new season's been really good. Uh, you know, personally snagged a couple goals, which is always great considering I'm not uh, very much not a goal scorer. So getting one or two. Uh, every year is always good. Uh, how's the season been for you guys in D1? You know what? It's been so different this year because, you know, and I don't want to sound arrogant or, or anything like that, but similar to what you just said, how, you, how you've how wrapped up the league with games in hand, we've been doing that for the past, whatever, six plus years, give or take. This season is one of the ones, maybe one of the only in the past, again, six or so years where we haven't. It's going to go down to the last match day of the season where obviously we still have a shot to win it, but we're up against someone else who has a shot to win it so it's been good we've missed a couple of key guys with uh you know injuries and and taking the season off for those injuries and letting their bodies recover and stuff so you know the added adversity i think will make us uh, all the stronger as we go into again the business end of this season and then into the playoffs and then into outdoor soccer so it's been enjoyable but uh to your point too it has been different but still been enjoying uh still been enjoying the challenge for sure and as mentioned, indoor soccer playoffs in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario are around the corner. In terms of timelines, women's soccer will kick their playoffs off first as they will begin this Sunday, March 3rd. Youth soccer will have their playoffs start next week beginning Monday, March 4th. And men's soccer will have their playoffs start in three weeks' time beginning on March 24th. A reminder to all that youth, men's, and women's soccer can be watched nightly at the Northern Community Center in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, from Sunday to Friday evenings between the hours of 5.30 and 9 p.m. The only night where games don't occur are on Saturdays. So, gee, with coming to the end of the season here, are you excited to get into the playoffs? I know that you've got uh, a title and a crown to defend. Yeah, yeah, the boys are really looking forward to uh, defending the title, hoping to go back-to-back, which would be, uh, you know, I was, I was ecstatic just winning it once. Going back-to-back would be, uh, you know, I'd be over the moon with it. Definitely. And I could I could tell you from experience, it's a heck of a feeling. So I hope for your sake that uh, that it goes your way as well. This is Daniel Scarpino and Gaetano Gallo, and you're listening to Full Time on the Game Sports Podcast and 91 Network. A reminder that Full Time is sponsored by Little Caesars Pizza. You can download and access the Pizza Portal app for any of the two locations in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario. Have a delicious hot and ready pizza from Little Caesars today. Ladies and gentlemen, that is Full Time. As we bring today's show to a close, we want to thank you for spending some time with us to talk about the beautiful game. Gee, as always, a pleasure, my man. Yeah, like I said, to kick the show off, you know, a day off, Habs game on, talking footy with you, like literally could not script a perfect, more perfect day than this. Always appreciate you having me on. Uh, Always, man. And uh, yeah, it sounds like a perfect script for you. And go chill, enjoy the rest of this night and uh, get ready to go into Friday tomorrow. A reminder to all of our listeners that the next episode of Full Time will be recorded the week of March 11th, 2024. In that show, we will discuss Europe's Big Five, the Champions League, the MLS, the FA Cup, and Euro 2024 qualifiers. As always, we will keep everyone in the loop with all of the happenings in the world of football. For weekly content, make sure to hit like, follow, and subscribe to all platforms, both the Game Sports Podcast and 91 Network on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Podbean. For Gaetano Gallo, my name is Daniel Scarpino, and thank you for tuning in to Full Time. We look forward to seeing you at kickoff next time, back here on the Game Sports Podcast and 91 Network. Best always.